What data was used to train Sora? We used publicly available data and licensed data. So videos on YouTube? I'm actually not sure about that. OK. Videos from Facebook, Instagram? You know, if they were publicly available, um, available, yeah, publicly available to use, um, there might be the data, but um, I'm, I'm not sure. That, I'm not confident about it. What about Shutterstock? I know you guys have a deal with them. I'm, I'm just not going to go into the details of, of the data that was that was used, but it was publicly available or licensed data. In this video, we're going to look at some copyright violation claims by OpenAI. Then we're going to look at uh, some news around Llama 4. And at the end of the video, we are going to look at the letter from Dario, who is the CEO of Entropic. So let's start with this uh, report from Financial Times, who reported that OpenAI says it has evidence China's DeepSeek used its model to train. They allege that DeepSeek used their API to collect data that was subsequently used for training DeepSeek models. Now, if that's the case, this is going to be the violation of terms of services of OpenAI because OpenAI does not allow you to use the outputs from its models to subsequently train your own models. But OpenAI has its own troubles when it comes to copyrighted data. The New York Times takes OpenAI to court for copyright violations. And this is not the first time. There has been a lot of different cases for copyright violations. But the cherry on top is that OpenAI says it's impossible to train AI without using copyrighted works for free. And they made this argument to the British Parliament to allow it to use copyrighted material for free. Now, claims for copyright for AI-generated material just became extremely hard to prove because the Copyright Office released part two of the Artificial Intelligence Report. According to this, for something to be copyrighted, the main component has to be human creativity. So if we were uh, to use a human element and then express creativity through the use of AI system, you can still copyright that material. However, extended production to materials whose expressive elements are determined by a machine would undermine rather than further the constitutional goals of copyright. So anything that is solely generated by uh, an AI system may not be copyrightable. Now, don't take my words for this. Uh, consult a, a lawyer. Now, on the one hand, Microsoft and OpenAI says that they investigated accounts believed to be deep seeks last year that were using OpenAI's API and blocked access on suspicion of distillation. That violated their terms of services. On the other hand, Microsoft is now hosting the DeepSeek R1 and it's going to be available on Azure AI Foundry and GitHub. Now, the beauty of um, open source is that everybody is going to benefit from it, irrespective of who created this. One quick example of startups using DeepSeek R1 is Perplexity. They recently integrated R1 and the results are really great. Based on my own experience, the search capability of R1 is probably one of the best that I have experienced so far out of any LLM. Now, since we're talking about open source, there is some news on Llama 4. So Z Mark Zuckerberg posted this on Facebook. He says this would be the defining year of AI. In 2025, I expect Meta AI will be the, the leading assistant serving more than 1 billion people. Llama 4 will become the leading state-of-the-art model and we will build an AI engineer that will start contributing increasing amounts of code to our research and development. To power this, Meta is building two gigawatt plus data, data center that is so large it would cover a significant part of Manhattan. So if you're still thinking about investing in NVIDIA, I think it's still a good opportunity, although not a financial advice. In fact, Mark brought it up during the earning calls of Meta platform. He talked about a lot of things, but I am specifically interested in Llama 4, like most of my audience. So here's what he said. Uh, Llama 4 is actively being trained. Llama 4 Mini has completed pre-training. There are going to be reasoning models 
and larger models are processing really well. They are going to be native multimodal and it's going to be under an omni model. So you should expect different types of inputs and outputs, including text and images. And these models are going to have agenting capabilities. Seems like they're really building these for real world applications. Also, he mentioned that there are going to be reasoning capabilities in Llama 4. So really exciting days. Now, before looking at Dario's letter, I wanted to highlight this uh, new GitHub project called Tiny Zero. It's open source project for the reproduction of DeepSeq R10 in countdown and multiplication task. It basically applies the same uh, training techniques to a much smaller model. And uh, through the um, reinforcement learning techniques, it developed chain of thought. It's a very interesting project. You can run this on your own data. And this whole thing was trained under uh, $30. So it's definitely worth checking out. In this last part of the video, I wanted to have a quick look at the blog post from Dario, who is the CEO of Anthropic on DeepSeq and export controls. So there are uh, two different parts of this blog post. One uh, specifically talks about DeepSeq. The other talks about export control. That's not a topic I'm interested in or, or have no expertise on it. So I'm going to not comment on that at all. But the parts relevant to DeepSeq are very interesting. And it really shows what kind of impact DeepSeq has on companies in the US. Because if you see almost everybody, either they are politicians involved in startups or leading research labs like OpenAI and now Anthropic had to comment on DeepSeq. This has never happened at this scale. Even when uh, Mistral released their uh, original model, which was on par with ChatGPT, nobody really commented on it. So it kind of shows you how significant DeepSeq is. Now, in this article, um, he talks about three dynamics of AI development, which I'll highly recommend everybody to read because it really puts things in perspective. So the first thing he mentioned was scaling loss. It's basically the, uh, that all things equal, scaling up the training of AI system leads to smoothly better results on a range of cognitive tasks across the board. So the idea is that if you use more compute and train these models longer with high quality of data, you will be able to improve or increase their intelligence. And that's why uh, you probably have seen these high valuation and huge raises of billions of dollars. Now, the second is shifting the curve. So this field is constantly coming up with ideas, large and small, that makes things more effective and efficient. And a core part of it is going to be architecture of the models. Now, all of them are uh, variations of the transformer architecture. Now, the shifting the curve could be not only because of the new innovations in uh, terms of the architecture, but also innovation in terms of the uh, hardware architecture as well. The third component is shifting the paradigm completely. So he says, every once in a while, the underlying thing that is being scaled changes a bit, or a new type of scaling is added to the training process. So this really gives you historical perspective that from 2020 to 2023, the main thing being scaled was pre-trained models. And usually you, you have seen the models are trained in two steps. One is pre-training where you feed in a whole bunch of data so that uh, the model just um, explores and understands the structure of the language. And then that is subsequently followed by supervised fine tuning. So in pre-training, models train on increasing amount of internet text with a tiny amount of other training on top. Supervised fine tuning was just one example. In 2024, the idea of using reinforcement learning to train models to generate chain of thought has become a new focus of scaling. Now, Anthropic, DeepSeek, and many other companies, perhaps notably OpenAI, who released the O1 preview model, have found this training greatly increases performance or certain select objectively measurable tasks like math and coding. So with this new paradigm, you basically start with ordinary type of pre-training. And then the second stage is RL. Now, there are different reinforcement learning techniques. DeepSeq came up with a very innovative technique or along with the training in 8 bits of floating point precision. This seems to have really enabled them to squeeze a lot of performance from 
They're not only V3, but also the R1 models. Now then he specifically talks about DeepSeq and how this comes into play when you look at uh, three dynamics of training AI models. So the initial V3s was purely a pre-trained model. Uh, and on top of that, they did some supervised fine tuning, which was followed by the release of R1, which really exploded and everybody is uh, commenting on R1. But according to Dario, the main innovation or the most important model out of this is V3, not R1. Because this appears to come close to the performance of a uh, state-of-the-art US model on some important task while uh, costing substantially less to train. Although we find that Cloud 3.5 Sonder in particular remains much better on some key areas such as real-world coding, right? Now, on benchmarks, V3 was surpassing Cloud on some of the benchmarks, but I think there is a case to be made that Cloud is still definitely better for coding. Okay, now, then he start talking about that 6 million number, and it kind of has become a point of contention. And in all honesty, I think if you look at the paper itself, they say that this is just for a single run, which makes uh, sense. Even Dario kind of agrees with that later in, the, in this blog post. But irrespective, whether it's $6 million or $60 million, the model was trained. It's substantially better than any of the other open source models or open weight models. And the great thing is that the model is available for everybody to run if you have the hardware. And just like a Microsoft is hosting it, Together AI is hosting it, Perplexity is hosting it. So you have a whole bunch of different options. And for some reason, um, what I have seen in the last week or so, people are trying to make it uh, US versus China. I think it's more of a closed source model versus open source models. Now, according to Dario, Cloud Sonnet was trained for a few tens of millions of dollars. So let's say we're talking about, if I were to guess, 30 to $60 million, and it's a mid-sized model. Now it's not uh, a distilled model as some people are reporting it to be, that it was distilled from a larger Opus 3.5. But the main part is that Sonnet was trained almost nine to 12 months ago, and DeepSeq model was trained in November and December. So we are talking about almost a year difference between the model. And his point is that, is that DeepSeq produced a model close to the performance of US models, which are seven to 10 months older for a good deal, but with less cost. And this is a really good argument. So uh, that is true that we are comparing with DeepSeq with models that were trained at least like six months older. Even in case of O1, it's an older model. O3 is going to be a much newer checkpoint. But we also need to keep in mind that DeepSeq R1 or V3 might be just a checkpoint. They could also have uh, much better models in training or already trained and they might release it at any point. Now, then he talks about the historical trend of cost curve decrease. So every year you would expect almost four times reduction when it comes to training the models. So according to him, we would expect a model three to four times cheaper than 3.5 Sonnet or GPT-40 around now. According to his statements, it's a worse model than 3.5 Sonnet, so it would not take as much compute. And then he makes an argument that we could potentially say that that, that might be 10 times cheaper. So he says all of this to say that deep secret 3 is not a unique breakthrough or something that fundamentally changes the economics of LLMs. It's an expected point on an ongoing cost reduction curves. What's different this time is that the company that was first to demonstrate the expected cost reduction was Chinese. But if you look at the current trends, his argument does not hold true because Haiku, which is supposed to be the smallest of the cloud models, the newer version is much more expensive compared to the older version. So I would argue that even Anthropic is not able to follow that cost reduction curve. Although in all fairness, they say that the architecture itself is very different than the previous generation of Haiku. Similar is the case with OpenAI models. So supposedly, if this were to hold true with the current setup, then 
we would see a cost reduction for O1 as well from O1 preview to O1, but that is not the case at the moment. Then he goes on to say that there are reports that DeepSeek actually has about 50,000 H100 GPUs. So that would be on a factor of two to three times of what a major AI companies have. And I don't think anybody is doubting that DeepSeek actually has the resources to train much larger models. They claim they were able to do it for much lower cost compared to what some of the leading AI companies in the US were able to do. Now, later in this post, he makes a case for export controls. And as I said in the beginning, I'm not really an expert or in the topic or not interested at all. So I'm going to put a link to this blog post. Have a read. I think it's a really fascinating read. And especially this three dynamics of the AI systems training really put things in perspective. Now, I'm going to end uh, the video with this news article. DeepSeek is a bad for Silicon Valley, but it might be great for you. In response to this, the uh, CEO of Hugging Face posted this. False. Because it's open source, fast and cheap, it will help create thousands of Silicon Valley startups, hundreds of thousands of jobs, massively set up competition, and create hundreds of billions of value for Silicon Valley. In my opinion, more positively impactful than any in all closed source AI startups. And it should be a wake up call for these startups to share more. I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching. And as always, see you in the next one.